everyone, and welcome uh, to the No Summary Golden Threads Online Conversations with Artists Who Don't Fit in a Box. For those of you who don't know, Golden Thread uh, is the first American theater company devoted to, middle, to the Middle East and is founded by playwright and esteemed director Taranj Yehazarian in 1996. Uh, I'm Sarah Fami. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm a scholar, a divisor, a community-based researcher, uh, and I'm currently an assistant professor of theater at Florida State University. Uh, I am wearing a light green blazer with a striped v-neck shirt, um, colorful earrings, and I have medium length, dark black hair with blue highlights in it. Hi, I'm Marina Johnson. I use she, they pronouns. I am a director, dramaturg, and scholar, currently a PhD candidate at Stanford University. Um, I am a pale woman with dark uh, wavy hair, wearing a navy blue shirt in front of a blurred window background. Um, I would like to take a moment here to acknowledge the people on the land on which we live and work today, the multiple Ohlone tribes. Despite the atrocities of colonization and genocide, Native communities persist today and are active in efforts to preserve and revive their culture. At Golden Thread, we are driven by a desire to expand this land acknowledgement statement to recognize our community's experience of occupation in the Middle East, the refugee crisis, and the displaced population. Whether we are immigrants displaced by political or economic events or U.S. born for one or more generations, we all appreciate the human connection to the land. The No Summary program is in its fourth season this year, uh, and in this new season, the program embarks on a virtual tour to universities across the nation, bringing Golden Threads conversations with artists who don't fit into a box uh, into theater and art classes. We'll start by introducing our guests. Yasmin Zakaria Mikael, she they, is a dramaturg, theater journalist, and oral historian with roots in and around Chicago. As a queer, fat, brown femme, they endeavor to amplify and archive stories that go lost, stolen, and forgotten. Their writing and research explores possibility models for a more inclusive and sustainable theater culture and industry. Next, we have Aishan Akhmete, who uses she, her pronouns. Uh, Aishan re received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin uh, Comparative Literature Program. Her research focuses on contemporary theater criticism in England and the reception of the art color theater productions that deal with Turkey's political history. Her latest works are forthcoming in the Journal of Dramatic Theory and Criticism and a collection of theaters of resilience in Turkey. And we have Tara Kamami, who is a New York based playwright best known for his plays Snail, Everything Will Be All Right, The Town of No One, Spite, White Picket Fences, The One Percy Ent, and co-writer on the musical The Life of Mary Rogers. He is currently working on a commission from Golden Thread Productions, where he is a resident artist. His plays look for the intersectionality of faith and culture, calling on his multi-faith and multicultural upbringing. I am personally exceptionally stoked about this no summary session uh, because it is a collaboration with the Middle Eastern Theatre Focus Group at the ATHA conference. ATHA stands for the Association of Theatre and Higher Education. Uh, and this session builds on numerous fruitful di discussions and conversations that we've had both at Atha and um, with Golden Thread, uh, this conversation seeks to analyze the status of post-pandemic theater criticism and the desired pathways forward, both in academia and in, pra in praxis from Swana artists. Uh, one of the Middle Eastern theater focus group's primary goals, uh, and I'm the focus group representative, so I'm the chair of the group this year. Uh, one of our primary goals is to serve as a hub for theater and performance scholarship uh, and artistry in the United States, home regions, and other diasporas. Uh, and this session is one of the intentional collaborations that we've really been working very hard on in the past few years to help bridge the academy and scholars in the academy with industry. So today we are 
We have the great honor uh, of building off of conversations that our group has had at the conference for several years and since its inception in 2019. Um, and, um, and a no summary panel uh, that I was so lucky that I got to moderate as part of the, in collaboration with Manatma last year. So Manatma stands for the Middle East and North African Theater Makers Alliance uh, at the convention that we had at the Arab American National Museum. Um, where we looked at topics of cultural competency in the multiple forms of criticism and the ways that Swana artists and academics seek to change the game. Uh, that conversation was very important and necessary. Uh, and we realized that there are multiple conversations that have to come out of it and it's a continued effort. Today, Yasmin, Aijan, and I are actually Zooming in live from the conference. We are in Austin, Texas. Um, and this is the indigenous lands of the Tanakwa, Comanche, and the Apache. Um, and we are here joining from, from Austin. So we're very excited to be in collaboration with Golden Thread this year. And I am zooming in from Palestine, where you can potentially hear calls to prayer behind me. Uh, so I hope that we also enjoy that uh, coming into the space. Before we dive into our conversation, I just want to take a moment to welcome the folks who are joining us here on the Zoom room. Uh, but also those tuning into the live stream on HowlRounds. Those here with us, please feel free to utilize the chat function to post your comments and questions throughout the conversation. So I want to start off our conversation with a quote from Yasmin that they said in a Kenefa and Shea podcast about theater criticism. Quote, the problem with arts criticism is also the problem with this country and figuring out how white supremacy culture is the thing that actually un undergirds a lot of the ways that we're moving through the world. And even when we're thinking about culture, it's not just about race and ethnicity. It's about how we speak, how we love, what our lived experiences are. So then, if we look at the microcosm of how theater criticism is replicating those issues, a lot of it is because of the distance we're trying to have, this mythical objectivity between who we're writing on the page and who we're witnessing on the stage." End quote. I love those very powerful world, words said by Yasmin, uh, and I think that can serve as a really good jumping off point in previous conversations, we've covered topics like how and when is theater criticism useful and problems with existing forms of theater criticism. But our hope today is to extend this conversation into how we can change the game. So to start, I'll ask each of you to share one priority for the future of Manasa theater criticism. Yasmin, uh, since it was your quote, would you mind starting? I appreciate that. Thank you so much for gathering us today. It's been really exciting, not only to be a part of Athra right now, but finally in like a little home base with Golden Threads. Um, and it was really fun being on that podcast almost a year ago or so. And it's really fascinating to me that we continue to have a lot of these questions and there's still so much depth that can come from them. Um, I think moving forward, I really just wanna see more investment in younger critics um, that are writing from our particular cultural location. Um, a lot of the times in Chicago, I feel like I'm the only one of Middle Eastern descent writing on Middle Eastern theater. Um, and I would love to just have more colleagues around me on the ground too. Um, and I want to be thinking about it in an abundance mindset because a lot of the times I'm straddling both dramaturgy and criticism. So if I don't write on it because I'm dramaturging, I'm not sure that it's going to get the same amount of depth that it needs. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to more investment um, in the next generation of critics, specifically of similar heritage, but also who are the folks out here that could also skill up even if they're coming from a different kind of career too. That's an amazing way to start this conversation, Yasmin. Thank you. <laughs> and I think abundance mindset really is like such an important thing. Um, and so not really feeling like more people um, is a bad thing. We actually want more voices in this conversation. Um, Aijan, since you're next to Yasmin, we won't do this always, um, but <laughs> maybe we can <laughs> head to you. Yeah, uh, I'm also really excited to be here. Thank you so much for holding that space for us. Um, I want to bring up something that I feel like is overlooked when we interact with criticism, which is like, um, these are just texts that are that emerge from certain contexts, and they are shaped by many layers of context that also bring so much bias with them. I just feel like, yes, I everything, yeah, uh, yes, everything that um, Yasmin said, but I also feel like we need to change the way that we think about criticism 
and just see these as products of their political um, context, social, cultural, um, and of course, personal. And when I say this, of course, um, it is important to challenge the authority of the critic as this arbiter of taste, as someone whose word is like um, taken to be either 100% true or you know, as like um, betrayers of a production, but they are just texts that surround these performances and these productions, and they do come with their bias. I think that's like really important when we think about criticism. Definitely. Definitely. Let's, Tarek, let's bounce it over to you now, yeah. and then we can uh, connect to these pieces. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, a priority goes back to something that has been asked for in, in many different facets, and that goes down to representation within a room, and that, you know, we need more um, people from our community either reviewing our work or at least in the offices of people who are reviewing our work. Because, you know, like I, I think of an experience I had working in a literary office one time for a theater company, and one day randomly the artistic director comes in and specifically hands something to me and says, could you read this and tell me what you think? And I was like, why is this person talking to me? And when I read it, it was obvious. It dealt with the Middle East, it dealt with Islam. And I realized I'm the only person in this building that can give you any insight into this. Um, and it was very clear it was written by somebody who was either it was not Muslim and not, you know, um, uh, uh, Arab or Middle Eastern or anything. Um, so at least having somebody within the room, either reviewing our work personally, or if somebody from outside our community is going to review our work, they have somebody in their office that they can talk to and be like, what was this about? So I think that would be a big priority for me. Definitely. From looking around at the faces um, on Zoom that I can see, it seems like that experience might have unfortunately replicated itself in different places as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Sarah. <laughs> the um. Yeah, it's so funny because Marina and I are switching off questions. It's like, what's the cutoff point? Um, bouncing off of that, it's definitely you know something that that is coming up is like that issue of representation and that issue of like, well, who gets to talk or advocate about the work that you're doing and who gets to review that and. I get the pleasure of asking this very complicated question that sometimes we get the same answer to, sometimes it's all over. Um, and so what, you know, given what you just said, what do you think culturally competent theater criticism looks like? Uh, and why is it important that as Swana folks, we actually push for cultural competence? Um, maybe we'll go to Tarek first since it was, you know, we <laughs> left off with you. Yeah, I mean, be, cultural competence in criticism, I think, goes into a, a, a larger point I or gripe I have about criticism is that the whole point to me of criticism is looking at like why this piece? What is the value of this piece? It's something I talk about with my students when I'm trying to get them to write, you know, papers critiquing art that it doesn't matter what you're seeing if you're seeing you know, like another production of King Lear from the Royal Shakespeare Company or like Fast and the Furious 37 or whatever they're up to at this point like you can have the same level of con uh, conversation because the question is why did they feel the need to make this and why did they feel the need to ask you to come see it and so I think that that it, it a lot of criticism needs to get back to that and if you could get back to that I think a lot of cultural competency would come into it because you would ask yourself as somebody not part of this culture what did I get out of it or what do I think I was meant to get out of it and then you can have a conversation on that level um, which I think would be much more competent than than the alternative yeah definitely um yeah thank you for that Aishan um I was like, there's a concept that I really like about criticism. It's a, it was an essay by Jill Dolan. Uh, it's a critical, it's a critical <laughs> generosity. Uh, it's, it's, it was misunderstood, I think, at some point as being always like nice and always writing about positive things. But what, I, how I understand that and what I think that that essay means is that um, speaking from a place of knowledge and that critics also evaluating 
and the uh, artist thinking about their relationship in terms of like, how much do I know? How much do we know about each other's work? And always justifying to your readers, what is it that works? How does this work communicate to the audience? And what is it that it does well? And um, justifying and informing your audiences on why it may not be doing that well. So uh, the most traditionally, we understand criticism to be like evaluating something. But even if you're evaluating, you need to be evaluating it from that from that standpoint, thinking like, what is it that these people are doing on stage? And how do I speak from a place of knowledge? And if that requires research, like digging deep more into a context and certain concepts that you see on stage and that maybe you don't know much about, then it is your duty as a critic or reviewer or journalist to dig more deep into those and look into how, okay, well, how can I inform my audience about this and how can I um, justify my own evaluation of this and speak from a place of like more knowledge. Yeah and one thing I love to keep in mind too is that cultural competency is not a box that you check. It's not something that like I did it it's over and I don't have to keep reevaluating <laughs> thing um and something in the quote that y'all shared of mine earlier is that culture goes beyond race and ethnicity it's also about social locations what other identities am i holding as i'm going into a space or writing on something something that i've really enjoyed researching so much is what happens after the criticism is written on a piece of paper because i think cultural competency doesn't end where you're writing it's also about what you what conversations emerge from what you've written and then how you handle them what does it mean for a critic to be just as reflexive like really investigating what my writing is doing and then reflect on what you're doing so you're going to be changing how you're writing and how you're approaching different cultures based on what you learned in this experience because writing and publishing is one part of it but if you've done something that is potentially harmful or you miss something and community is calling you in I think you have a duty to be accountable to your community and address it somehow um, what I have questions about is like, what is the productive way to be doing that? So many critics don't even want to touch social media. They don't want to be getting in the Facebook comments with the folks that are really upset with their pieces. Um, but I'm always curious about what happens after it. Cause I see cultural competency is ongoing and we're all coming from different contexts and there's always going to be a rigor that we can approach and see. And then there's going to be things that we miss or mistakes that we make. And I think a part of that competency is handling it in a way um, that is what does the artist deserve? Uh, I want to say something. I felt like uh, what you say is like really significant, but um, that's what I meant. Like in the previous question, when we challenge the critic or read reviews as just any other text, um, I think this is also plays into that. Like your critic or your review is not the ultimate word on um, a, a theater piece. It's just one of the many texts that's around it and that has equal value. And it's just an ongoing conversation in the public sphere that is like extended beyond the performance space, but then other people are going to react to it and are going to engage in a conversation with it. And if there was something that is missing that you missed a point, for example, uh, it is then a people's responses on social media become a part that complement your uh, or maybe correct or refine your understanding of this piece. So these all, I think these all together, all these should be considered as a part of a larger event, but they're all equal value and they all uh, surround the same text, the production that are in conversation with each other. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point too, because every like work of writing, you have a conversation with the people that um, that see it or you know like as a playwright like you do a, a talk back after a reading or like as a novelist you go and read your work at a bookstore and have conversations with people but like as a as a critic you you write something it goes out there and then like you said like the, you could go through like the Facebook comment feed but you don't want to touch that and so as something that was intended to start a conversation the person who created it does not end up engaging in that conversation you know but some do. And I think that yeah. possibility models <laughs> yeah. of like what it means to be a really engaged critic within your community. Um, and we're definitely in a turning point where people want to know who their critics are, where they're coming from, um, and have dialogues. But there's some critics that are just so reticent to that. And 
having a, a separation between the critic and the artist is actually more ethical for our business. And that's also up for debate. Very much. I think something that keeps coming up from like just what, what's been circling so far is that we, you know, you're all advocating for, uh, or we're making assumptions that like the reviewers are knowledgeable and like they're going into this with like an open heart and an open mind and like they're willing to engage further. And I think one of the issues that we keep coming up against is that the reviewers that keep coming in to see a lot of Swana performances, uh, especially in the US, are not coming at it from that level of cultural competence. Uh, and they're coming at it from a very um, Islamophobic rhetoric. They're coming at it from a very, uh, a very specific perception of this is what we think this type of theater should be. Um, and this is who it's written for. And obviously we're pushing against that, but I'm curious how, how you feel like the, who we're writing for, how that has an impact on the types of reviews that are coming out. And then the issue of like, well, are there enough reviewers that are currently out there that are culturally competent? Um, or is that something that we are still aspiring to achieve? So I guess it's a two part follow up <laughs> question. I, I mean, I think in terms of like, are there enough reviewers out there who are culturally competent? I think that that's just like with all aspects of society right now, it's an ongoing thing. And sometimes you are and sometimes you aren't, you know, it depends on the person. It depends on the culture that you're trying to be competent about. I think for me, what at a bare minimum there needs to be is um, an acknowledgement of what you are knowledgeable on and, and what you're not. I think I would totally be okay with a reviewer writing in, in something like, I don't know a lot about the background of this, but as a theater piece, here's what I thought about it in terms of, of uh, stagecraft. You know, I think that would be totally fair, but that's not something I think, at least I've never read or encountered. It's fascinating though, because in Chicago, there's actually a model for that. What does it mean to have disclaimers about your own background? It's prescripted magazine um, that was definitely bootstrapped in Chicago by a Black queer femme person. And there's um, a questionnaire kind of that all of the different critics fill out. And so you can go and look and learn more about them. And even sometimes within the pieces, it's very much prioritizing what locations are you coming from? Um, what I'm curious about too is how we have editors that can really challenge some of the dog whistles and really horrible metaphors or racist puns that a lot of the time happen, not just in Middle Eastern reviews, but a lot of people of color's work um, where we see so much language that is meant as a joke is actually super harmful and hurtful. Um, just a couple <laughs> sentences to throw in there. Yeah, um, I I was like um, studying a play. It's a it's a play about the Kurdish experience in Turkey, and it was staged in the UK. And most of the reviews they were like, "Oh, this is only a play that Turkish people can understand." Um, and um, it was so problematic on so many levels. It's a first like um, coming from a place of like assigning these audiences to plays based only on the subject matter or the playwright or the theater company, um, that is quite problematic. It's also there There might be people reading it and being discouraged from attending it. And that is so unfair to a theater company who relies only on the box office income, who has no other funding. So those kinds of statements, and um, like Tariq said, at least like a or like Asmin said like a disclaimer on okay there are things I don't know about this play but then we assigned historically such a status to the critic that it's so hard for a, the critic to admit that I don't understand this there's so much anxiety or, around the critical responses that they give as audiences because after all they're also audiences um, but then they make such harmful statements and those are ultimately harming the theater ecology because 
who can survive without the funding as a marginalized or like a fringe theater or an off of Broadway theater in the US. And this might be jumping ahead, but I think some of the solutions are the people in this room. What does it mean to be writing on our colleagues, on our collaborators to make sure that they get the criticism that they deserve? Um, and it's stamping it into an archive um, that doesn't hurt as much. It also becomes powerful marketing materials because we know we're living in disaster mm -hmm. capitalism right now. Um, and so what does it mean to actually be co-struggling together, um, noticing in our cities like, oh, if there is SWANA work going up, what can we do to write on it or empower other folks? Um, I think so, where it also gets tricky is just like the labor that so mo most, most of us have to do to even be writing for the papers of record if we get the opportunity um, or yeah, building, building the table, making it even bigger so more folks can be learning how to write criticism and doing it for each other as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to think of like a solution. I, I was thinking about it like in the lead up to this, like, oh, what could we do? We could create like something online where we review our own things and then people could comment on it. And then I was like, wait, this that's Facebook. Like I just created Facebook, you know, like so the the idea of like, how do you solve this? It, it really comes down to having more of us, you know, around writing for the the papers of note, like you said, um, um, and and I, I guess hearing this out loud, I don't want to be too nihilist and be like, there's nothing more we can do. But I mean, I think that is a major aspect of it is um, who who from from our community is, is at these places. Yeah, and I speak, I think that can speak to the collaboration that happens across disciplines too, um, especially for scholarship. There are so many different Swana Middle Eastern scholars that are writing, but they don't necessarily have competencies in theater themselves, but they're stellar writers. Um, so I'm just so curious of what it would mean for some of those folks to be inspired to like try to take up what it means to write um, in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, but something that I've been dealing with a lot um, is just... Um, do I have the same kind of prestige for writing for magazines and newspapers as I would as an academic journal? Um, because even if I'm sitting here with like 60 plus publications, I've still had institutions tell me that my own writing is not strong enough um, or doesn't have the, the weight of the different journals that I'm supposed to have as an academic. Um, when I'm sitting here so comfortable in being all ACK and teaching at DePaul, like that feels good for me. I'm doing the work that I need to, um, but it's fascinating when I can sit here with so many publications for so many different audiences and it's still not seen as of value in a way if it doesn't live in a journal that mm -hmm. is unpaid like yeah. what am <laughs> absolutely like I they don't want that intense materials I'm not mm -hmm. there yet maybe in 20 years but if I if I get back into academia that is um but yeah the weight of the materials how they're even in our dossier or whatever like there's other problems too <laughs> Yeah, I was also when you said like uh, I had the opposite experience, whereas like I've been academically published, but one time, no, it was twice. I wrote to like a mainstream um, publication that I want to like. I used to work as a reviewer in Turkey, but my only experience is in Turkish language. So they asked me like, do you have any sample writing of like review? And I said no. Um, okay, let me try translating this, and then it doesn't translate because completely different audience, completely different. Uh, everything is different. And it's hard to translate the context of the context that I wrote that in. And then I tried my best, uh, but I was also dismissed for not having a background here and then not having the language skills um, to write and which um, is, I it's debatable, uh, but that even like, inclusion of me as someone who lives here as an immigrant but has theater experience and a scholarship etc I was not like accepted into those institutions as a writer of reviews um yeah so the, those are the but then of course like why do I go to the then the question of like it's something that we will discuss maybe later on but like what kind of platforms can we write on what is it, what is it that people value as criticism again, or as like a legitimate publications, and what is it that is gets dismissed? Where can we make our voices be heard? And that's just an issue of cultural competency right there as well, not from the critic, but from the institution, because why are they not valuing those uh, those experiences and, and those, you know, uh, things that you've done in the same way? And that I think is another form of cultural competency. 
Yeah, and very much goes back to Yasmin's, I think, earlier points from the quotes of how theater criticism replicates this white supremacist undergirding of our culture and society. Um, when you were mentioning, Yasmin, that uh, the academic review that like is unpaid, but then also probably behind a paywall for most people as well. Mm -hmm. And so like we do have all of these layers of the institution saying, this is how you get tenure or how you look like a scholar, whatever that means. Um, but it usually uh, puts work away from the people and public scholarship then is of course not treated as seriously because everyone can read it, which is, uh, yeah problematic on so many levels. But I want to take, I think, this point and then go into where uh, Tarek sort of reinvented Facebook, um, because I think that it's <laughs> what you were pointing to was so great and exciting, which is like, yeah, we could do these other methods, but they haven't been taken seriously before. So I think all of those things tie into a question that uh, Sarah and I had prepared before, which was that theater criticism in the past has really taken a form um just the one and we've seen some other forms emerge um Yasmin I think you're the one who had uh, alerted me to a podcast that was like dueling critics um maybe yes okay great um and so I think we've seen this as a form also um you mentioned rescripted but what other forms do we think could be useful um and then what are the strengths and weaknesses to these multiple forms I think also I want to tack onto that question just because Yasmin you mentioned like it seemed as though you had experience with critics not participating in conversations, feeling like they could have the final word and then not responding. And I'm curious if you have seen any responses on social media or other platforms be a useful tool. Um, so two part question. Um, I will say that even though Twitter is dying in a different way every single day, there's still much value to it just because of the communities of connection that you have, not only just across the nation, but across the world. Um, and I've seen, it's funny to see more useful production, um, productive conversation happening in Twitter threads than in a Facebook comment sphere. Um, but I think it's because folks are really more <laughs> attuned to different kinds of politics on Twitter. And there's just like a nuance that maybe exists there since we do have the niche of like academic Twitter. And then there's like a theater academic Twitter that you can stumble upon. Um, and I, it's, it's my social media that really gets me more jobs than anything I put on my CV. So I think that's also pointing to the power of people's own voices and being themselves. Um, what does it mean to have equal measure, measures, personal and professional kind of swirl together? Folks are comfortable with it. Um, and definitely some of the models that I'm fascinated by are the ones that put theater back into our bodies as critics. What does it mean to talk about what we saw that is in like a talking mode or a witnessing mode rather than distilling into the perfect words on the page? Um, so a lot of the times I look, I still look to token theater friends um, as one of those first models of what does it mean to have um, some critics sitting around really discussing the work um, earlier iterations of that podcast sometimes I think did a like scale method of more of like a thumbs up down middle situation but then it more so involved into long form podcast and conversation. And I enjoy that too. Um, and I've also worked as an editorial producer on different news shows. And so I know what research and kind of dramaturgy um, goes behind the scenes and really crafting an audio piece for somebody. Mm -hmm. And those are usually made more in collaboration um, rather than your singular critic working with one editor. You're really on a team of folks and challenging each other because you both witnessed the same kind of material. Um, there's a there's another podcast made by younger theater makers. I'm totally blanking on it, um, but definitely fronting um, theater makers of color and another podcast. So I see so many different kinds of offshoots, um, but I locate Token Theater Friends as generally one of the first there. Uh, thank you for sharing those. And if the other name comes to mind, we would love to, to hear it at some points in the conversation. Um, but from those, which I think are all really exciting and ways that like you've experienced with productive conversations. And I keep coming back to the word conversation because I feel like it's so important in our theater world, but actually in the conversations we've been having about critics and it's really been a conversation with other people and the critic is just a person who, who sends in a word or a missive of sorts. Um, but yeah, so as far as social media goes uh, for others, uh, Aijan and Tarek, are there things that you've seen either working there or other forms that you've experienced, um, either in the States or internationally? I have a colleague who 
Okay, her name is Eylem Ejder. She's in Turkey. She's a practicing critic and scholar. And her last name is E-J-D-E-R. If anybody wants to look up, uh, she has a brilliant article. I don't think it's behind paywall. Uh, they have a, a collect. They they practice collective criticism, and they have a group called Feminist Endeavor. And she writes in detail about how they do collective criticism. So she told me about, I had the I was lucky enough to talk to her, and then she she told me that there's like a they exchange emails over like a group email about a play, and everyone like you know they have a dialogue, a conversation among themselves, and then they publish that. So I found this idea fascinating. Fascinating, and I think it does a lot to challenge that idea of the critic or like being one text serving as that like arbiter of taste or like as the ultimate judge on uh, on a play and production and also invites us like to think about these as like what I like to call paratexts or like like I said all different texts of equal value surrounding it and it does a lot in terms of like to challenge that all these like uh, in the feminist endeavor coming together uh, in a plurality of voices and expressing that i find that i find that really valuable uh yeah if you look that up her uh, i think it's called critical endeavors um about like theater criticism uh and it is also i think very significant that they came up with that in the face of political polarization in turkey as a response to that uh, so i also find that very valuable she has like a really uh detailed background about that too if you want to look at that Thank you for that. Um, yeah, in terms of like what, like how can we, I don't know, like like tackle this. I kind of go back to the same point as well with with social media. I mean, social media does seem to be the best way to to get a hold of your own narrative in a way. But it's so daunting because this the idea of social media has become so toxic within society. And the idea of, well, let's go harder on social media is like a thing that makes me want to go into my shell and go away, right? But, but honestly, it, I mean, you think about in other facets of life, where do you get your your recommendations for things and I think about like like my wife is really into booktube you know so there's just like a whole section of youtube of people reviewing books and everybody is watching each other's videos and getting recommendations um and and so and there's all there's a whole bunch of different like like examples of that and so the idea comes down to how do you organize all of this social uh content and I think maybe that is a is an avenue to explore instead of creating the content itself people are more than willing to create the content how do you bring it all together in a constructive way for people to kind of come and find it at this hub hashtags yeah <laughs> the hashtags. power of TikTok. honestly it's been really fruitful <laughs> Um, some of my students and some of their more creative projects will be, I ask them sometimes they can be more creative with um, the final papers if they don't want to write a paper, what are other works of merit across media that they can be producing, and so many TikTok pieces on criticism or essays via TikTok are very emergent. Um, and whenever I, and I, my day job is a nonprofit marketing for a newspaper, a newsroom. And so even just the organizing of hashtags, it's like, there's still power there, even as the infrastructure for socials falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> There's a practice on a, there's like a theater website in Turkey and uh, people publish reviews online. And um, there's a function on the website where you can rate the the review and you can comment underneath. Um, I think I really like that a lot. Uh, and then there's like facial expressions for each rating. So when you uh, read a review, you see those expressions um, on the, up, like, and it's at the top of the page. It's like, uh, that's the first thing that you see when you really read a review. Um, I really like that practice. It's so fun because then it's not directly on the critics Facebook page, which also has the emoji buttons courtesy of Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I appreciate the comments around like the question around organization because I feel like sometimes I'm inundated with things and I don't understand hashtags very well so I don't feel like I've ever understood how they organize but this is really exciting to I guess come up to speed on social media embarrassingly um but to also hear of other ways that that can work for us um as you were all talking I also thought of what I don't think is a new thing but I was in Chicago uh, directing a piece right after Leolina had opened and I knew that Leolina had a swana night 
Um, and then the show I was directing also had a Swana night and it was so lovely to have all of these Swana folks like in a space talking. And it's making me think of like, oh, these are also ways that we can have those kind of call in or not even if there needs to be a call in, but also just these dialogues between community um, that can then potentially lead to uh, criticism from this group that's all there at once. Cause it seems like a lovely uh, thing. I wasn't at the Leilina one, but it seemed wonderful. Yeah. In Chicago, I love her. I'll throw down for her in so many ways. And how we organize is just across so many different channels. So like we have listservs, we have a Facebook group, there's a WhatsApp of a hundred Middle Eastern theater people that are and um, Facebook groups and different collectives. And so folks across all of them are just so interconnected. So it's not as much of a challenge to mobilize each other and really be inspirational in the ways we show up. Um, but it's also about taking up space in these predominantly white institutions. Um, I served as one of the dramaturgs on Leolina um, and I was really fortunate to be a part of a lot of that public programming, um, especially like coffee and calligraphy night and making sure that talkbacks are actually led by folks that have been in the process. Cause I think there's a nuance there that we lose when it's a general mm -hmm. literary person or intern um doing those conversations um but yes I'm obsessed with what Chicago has really shown up for Middle Eastern work in the last year or so feels like a renaissance in a certain way definitely and that community engagement is so important in these conversations um I'll take a quick pause here just to remind those who are tuning in just now of the conversation that this is no summary golden threads online conversation with artists who don't fit into a box. And we're here in conversation with Yasmin, Aijan, Tarek, uh, and my uh, co-moderator, Sarah, talking about theater criticism and new paths forward. For those of you here in the Zoom room, please feel free to participate in the conversation by utilizing the chat function or raise your hand to address a question directly. And I actually noticed that we have some chats, uh, one from Sheila about substrate arts, um, if that was what someone was mentioning, and then also <laughs> Yumaira, Thank you for uh, commiserating with me on that hashtags. Um, yes, I think <laughs> I think Yasmin can teach us a thing or two here. Um, so appreciate that. Um, yeah, excellent. Social media is its own thing. Uh, you either love it or you hate it, and it is very interesting to see what the future of criticism is going to be, uh, and just like the future of theater in this ever-evolving digital realm. So that's a whole other thing, uh, which takes us straight into this next question of here in this room today, just on this panel, like we're a group of scholars and artists and, and scholar artists, and we do a lot of everything. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, how can academia and theater professionals create a more mutually beneficial relationship around theater criticism. And this can either be something that you've seen in the past or something that you've personally benefited from, or maybe just acknowledging things that need to just be improved a little bit. Well, something I always tackle with, with my students since I mainly teach uh, intro to theater classes. So I get students who are 18, 19, just starting college. And um, and I they are supposed to write reviews themselves of the shows that they see and things like that. And I always tell them that the, the point of the class is not to make you all uh, theater artists um, to go change your majors and everything, but it's to make you like a better theater audience member, to be more knowledgeable on it. And I think in terms of how can academia help this idea of of criticism i think it's it's giving it's helping people have the tools to recognize what a bad review is and what a good review is you know like this is what theater this is what criticism is supposed to be and then you're going to try doing it to get a hand at, at at knowing what it's like to create it and so when you do read those reviews that um uh that like yasmin you had mentioned like use like really like problematic jokes and things like that in them that as a as a reader you'll be able to read that and go oh this so this is a, a flag for me that this review is probably not the most shouldn't be the most trusted one for me on on this work of art right here and so I think that's one way academia can help combat this I definitely go for it no go for it Yasmin <laughs> 
Um, I agree too. And I wonder what are the ways that we can be amplifying our colleagues across the field as well? Who are the people that we know are doing this right? Um, how are we each other's our own case studies? How can we um, be using the work of playwrights we really enjoy, um, bringing them into the classroom? Since a lot of our curriculum, we have to be fighting to get people of color onto our syllabi or just like totally reinventing the wheel sometime. Like theater did not start in Greece. Why are we starting in Greece for my 101 <laughs> uh, intro to theater history? Um, and so I think it's just a real like amplification across colleagues and our scholarship of like, who do I want to bring into this room? What lineage of writing do I want to plug into? And just getting into the brain of our students, I think that's where we can get really intergenerational with the folks that have been working on this before and hopefully inspiring the next round of theater critics. Um, I work at a conservatory program. So, so all of the students that I'm dealing with are across all of different majors. And it's one of the few classes that they're all swirled together, actors, designers, dramaturgs, playwrights. Um, and so just teaching them first, like what is criticism um, and figuring out the ways that they can be inspired to write on it or be working um, across their own cohorts and figuring out what does it mean to write on a colleague's play in a sense too. So this building camaraderie and collaboration um, early on. Yeah, and I think it's like what you said at the beginning is what I had in mind for this is like um, teaching younger people or um, if or other groups of people uh, how to write criticism, but not um, it pro pro ideally in, in con conjunction with theater, um, theater companies. So something that I have seen recently is a public theater. They have a BIPOC uh, critics lab. I think they've been having it for the past three years is that they are trying to train uh, critics of color and uh, help them like uh, give uh, voice to their work as critics as well. And another thing I've seen is that in, uh, a colleague of mine in Canada was also teaching younger people um, at the, to, they were writing about um, the Toronto Fringe Festival. Uh, like she's a scholar, but like she, she was teaching all these young people, how do we write about these performances? And uh, they also have work on also like BIPOC um, theater criticism, um, like cultural competency. Uh, so I feel like all these initiatives, they could be broadened also to be more specific to maybe Swana theater makers and Swana like scholars who work on this field and people who who have the cult cultural competency to write about these plays. So I think these initiatives, training, education, um, that also happen with the artists themselves, uh, which is like, like you said, that distance between the theater makers and the critics that we think should exist may may not ex like it, it does not have to exist because we are all you know in this together all uh occupying the same spaces so i think that uh these are really significant yeah i think that so one thing that i've been working on trying to be a bit more diligent about is making sure that there are no disposable assignments in the classes that i teach and i feel like something like write a the write a review uh on like a play is something that we could potentially start thinking of as like this is something that we could be doing and it's like they're actually doing assignments where they're actually going out and they're writing pieces and then we as their instructors are then going over and reviewing does this measure up to cultural competency is it actually reliable um but I think one issue that I've run into, and I don't know if any of you have also experienced this, so I'd love your input on it. Uh, there isn't there isn't a lot of Swana theater going on in places where I where I have worked or currently work. And it's just, and I think that is one of the fundamental issues is that even if we look at okay, what's the university producing? The university is not producing Swana material because they run into the issue of casting and they run into the issue of recruitment and we don't have enough swana students in theater and and it's like this you know a chait a constant like catch 22 type of thing and so i'm curious what you think of can be a very tangible immediate action that we can be doing in our classes uh, for those of us who are starting to teach again in the fall like in, in about two weeks what is something that we can be doing at predominantly white institutions 
to further this conversation, but to make sure that we're not just having the exact same conversation over and over again um, and seeing the same results. Well, what we potentially are going to have access to is a full database of plays that folks mm -hmm. can be pulling from. <laughs> Spoiler alert for another ASA panel that is coming up <laughs> and a new open access material that's going to be hitting these theater streets across the country. Um, yeah, major plug. But I think there's a lot that we can do in assigning plays. And then we're imaginative people. So what does it mean to be actually writing on plays, even if we're not writing on performances of plays? Um, because half of theater criticism is not just what's happening up on that stage. Stage, but it's how is the script functioning? What are the questions mm -hmm. I still have? Why this um, why now kind of dramaturgy scope? So there's at least half of a review potentially that can be written at least from plays that are read. Um, and it's one way to get voices into these stories in a very low stakes way, even for um, schools that are majority white. And it's a very definitely um, controversial figuring out how casting works like would we rather not have this play produced versus let's just keep it in the classroom um, but classroom space is definitely the, the way we can play um, through these stories and also exercise our writing skills um, in, a, in a way that feels safer and one that is of peer mentorship in a sense too. Um, sometimes on first drafts I invite my students to bring in they're writing and I'm not the one that has the first eyes on it. The person next to them does. What does it mean to actually have eyes and co-mentorship within our own classrooms and our students? And so they're sometimes going to get into conversations um, that I'm not going to understand, even if I still consider myself a young person, um, <laughs> but the level of knowingness um, across generations too. And that's, uh, again, the low stakes, the practicing, the speaking and draft, that's why we have our classroom spaces, hopefully being um, as open as possible for fo so folks feel comfortable. This could include maybe assigning also um, the digital recordings of performances if they mm. exist, just like, of course, remembering that it's a different medium. Uh, but like Yasmin said, um, even writing about it, the text itself is part of uh, reviewing something because that's a part of the performance as well. Uh, and dramaturgy, like you said, or like a st script analysis goes hand in hand with uh, writing a review. It's like one of the components of that. So that could be another solution. Um, there are like some companies from Turkey that have, for, for example, their recordings with English subtitles uh, that people English speakers can also watch. And I'm sure like that's only one example and others exist as well. And I know HowlRound has such a vast digital library of recordings of plays. Mm -hmm. I personally don't know how many of them are Swanasa, um, but that's something that we can also advocate for in our future productions. Yes. So what would it have meant? Um, I know this is like big fancy schmancy, but if Leolina had been broadcast on the HowlRound, like mm -hmm. what a, what a um, addition to the field it would be if a play like that was able to actually be seen by more folks and than those that are sitting in that Goodman space. Um, and it also connects to a lot of conversations that we had at the peak of the pandemic of what does it mean to have digital access always on all shows kind of thing, um, even though we are contending with rights and paying folks for their time and um, their labor there. But there's there's so much more that we can dream. And we've seen pieces of the infrastructure be built, um, but potentially not actually executed fully because we're back to business as usual in a lot of contexts across our field. I think too, it, it also, I mean, this is kind of piggybacking off of some ideas you guys have touched on already, but just in terms of like what plays we're assigning to have to, for them to read and, and making sure that it's plays from, you know, from, from our artists. I had this uh, experience at, at a school I taught at where they decided to send out this mass email to be like, here are like the the lists of plays that you can choose from to make sure that we're, you know, all choosing the right things. And I, I just always remember they had the one section where they said, you know, okay, this is the international section. So pick a play from this list. And the international section was Anton Chekhov and, and like the guy who wrote Equus and it was a British playwright. And I'm like, I mean, sure, they're not American, but that's not really the international uh, perspective that you're getting. And so, um, you know, not in terms of that module, but I just kind of started choosing my own plays, not on there, hoping I would fly under the radar. And so I purposely chose for a period of time a writer that's also contemporary. So I had them reading one of Mona Mansour's plays, 
um, mainly so uh, they're introduced to writers, contemporary writers that they might see other work from. And while they're out in the world, walking around to be, oh, a production by this playwright I remember from my intro to theater class, maybe I'll, I'll be more open to go see that because that's part of the problem is, you know, our work is not being promoted in the same way that uh, that it is with other artists. And so people aren't as willing to take a risk on a, pl a play by a playwright they've never heard of before or starring an actor they've never heard of before. So getting that into up and coming audience members ears, um, you know, is a thing. Not that I'm looking at my my classes as a selling point for future art, but but I think it does get the idea out there to people that, you know, this work is out there and also it's relevant to you. It's like a lot of my, I get a lot of um, uh, MENA students, but a lot of them aren't. And, you know, we read that play and it's all about your identity being from two different worlds. And so the the class discussion turns into everybody talking about, you know, their background. And a lot of them are immigrants themselves or are the children of immigrant immigrants. And a whole conversation spout, sprouts up from that. And they realize, oh, this play that was written by a Lebanese American playwright isn't just for Lebanese Americans. Like I'm Dominican or Dominican American, and this totally was relevant to me. And so I think it's also that idea that you can find value in plays written for, you know, cultures that aren't your own. Yeah, and, yeah. and Tar, I want to totally push back against uh, we should not, like you're not using <laughs> classes to also, you know, <laughs> sell the idea of modern living playwrights. Yeah. Because I think we totally should be, because if we're not doing it in classes, then who is? Like nobody is. So I yeah. I will contest that one and say that we, <laughs> I am all pro, you know, telling them <laughs> this is who's doing the work at the moment and and totally having them read it and engage of it and and practice doing it. So thank you for that. Yes. Um just sitting here flabbergasted at Anton Chekhov being on the international playwrights list, but um, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Um, I want to just uh, read Catherine Corey from the chat uh, with, there is a step between reading a play by Mina Swana writers and mounting production, which does call for actors of Mina and Swana backgrounds. That is reading plays aloud in class with no external audience, which gives students an opportunity to put themselves in the shoes of a character from another background and hopefully gain new perspectives, um, yes. which is such a rich thing to do in the classroom. So thank you, Catherine, for bringing that up. Um, and I love, I mean, the focus has sort of shifted to the classroom for a bit here for us, which makes sense as a room full of people <laughs> who educate uh, in addition to doing arts in all of these forms. And I'm hoping that the critics who are not necessarily in school, um, but maybe can start to see themselves as lifelong learners and take a few lessons from what is being said here, um, because these are all amazingly helpful ways to get people's brains to start thinking um, in criticism in new ways. And I actually feel like maybe the Barbie movie um, has been an interesting thing to see, like the very conservative criticism has become memes because the, the conservative criticism is perhaps a selling point in some ways for others, um, <laughs> which I've really enjoyed seeing how that's been um, turned on its uh, head a little bit. I, um, Yasmin, before we move on to a different question, I wonder if you could say a little bit more for those who aren't at ATHA, um, you gave a little bit of the drop about the open access um, set up so do you mind saying a little bit more there I honestly want to pass the mic to Sarah because I think he can really he's on the panel I will just be uh sitting pretty in the audience <laughs> so uh yeah a quick plug for that uh and we can mention this and chat about this more bit at the end as well uh and myself Aijan and Susie Elmagar who's not on this call at the moment we have been working tirelessly for about a year and a half now, uh, compiling a digital database that draws on a lot of other existing resources that are out there with the intention of creating a handbook that is specific to the teaching and the scholarship and the production of Swana Theatre. Uh, it is divided up into different sections. We have a section that is completely on plays, casting breakdowns, the synopsis of the play and where to access it, including a section on notable reviews that have come and, and notable critiques that have been published on it. Uh, we also have a section on anthologies, uh, of play anthologies and where to access those. 
we have another section that is dedicated to the scholarship that's been published, whether that is books, book chapters, academic journals. Uh, and then we have another section that is on uh, scholars, where to find them, who they are, what institutions we're at, because we often run into this issue of people are working in silos and they can't connect uh, and what their specialty is. And so how you can reach out to them if you want them to come guest lecture at any point on any of the specific plays that are on there or anything else in their uh, expertise. We also have a section on theatres. Um, so Golden Thread is on there, but it's all of the different theatre companies that are dedicated to doing this work, both in the US uh, and elsewhere, uh, and specifically focusing on where people can access these productions. So this is an ongoing live uh, platform. We are happy to continue talking about it. Please come to our session if you're actually at ATHA. Uh, if not, then we'll share our email contacts and and either we welcome you to contribute to it, we welcome you to or invite you to further this, this conversation with us. Uh, but yeah, it's something that we're working on that we're realizing is gonna, and we're hoping to visualize it into a fully visualized like website itself. So that's something that has been taking up a lot of our time, realizing that it's not a single effort, but rather a collective collaboration. So I'm I'm really, really excited about that. It's been a long time coming. So Yasmin, thank you for the shout out. Yes, and also Marjan was here, um, and so just a shout out to Marjan, who also has a database that has inspired this, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, so for her work, we're always building and, and growing and changing these things with each other, um, which is, yeah, that's all we can ask for. Um, we have about 13 minutes left together. I have a question I think that we've sort of been bouncing back and forth around, but I want to invite anyone who's in the audience to put a question into the chat or raise your hand, we can have you unmute and talk with us as well and make it a really, uh, really a conversation. Um, but so we were going to end this with like our set questions with what is an ideal path forward for theater criticism? And we're all very different people. Uh, so I think we're coming at this also in, in different ways as we've noticed, but there are a lot of um, common threads that have continued to come up. Um, both as far as education goes, as far as actual printed theater reviews go, um, printed, depending, digital. Um, and then also what we also might like to see for ourselves as dramaturgs, as scholars, as playwrights. So I just want to invite this conversation to sort of swell again with things that we are looking forward to uh, or things that we really hope continues to happen. Um, and if there's anything that we really don't want to happen again, if there are things that we want to just flag as, hey, we're, we've actually thrown that in the bin for now, um, this is a great time to contribute that too. Who wants to start? I know it's a broad ask. I feel yeah. like, sorry, it's hard for you. Bro. No, go ahead, go ahead. I'm still actually forming my idea in my head. So. <laughs> Uh, so I see reviews or criticism as implicitly prejudiced utterances, and I read them, I read into the bias into them in, in my own like research. And I feel like checking your own bias when you're writing something is, is the first thing that you need to do. Uh, and besides a disclaimer, I think it's like, first of all, just reflect on what is it that you're biased against? What is the culture, the political, social, all these like contexts that surround you because which which you, you and your writing emerge from. And when you're watching a play, all these become a part of like this very complex critical response. But if you don't realize, if you yourself don't reflect on that, then it becomes harmful. Even like, it doesn't have to be explicit, but there's there's so much implicit bias that is, uh, if you read between the lines in these reviews, uh, in the reception of Swana artists. And another thing that I really, really care about is the changing the ways that we think about criticism and we talk about criticism, our concepts around it. Uh, like I said, to me, these are just texts that emerge from these contexts. And I think it's important that um, to have that plurality of voices, it's important that we do first challenge the existing misconceptions um, about around what a critic does, what criticism is, uh, what counts as criticism, what doesn't count, what do we value. Uh, yeah, I think those are the first things that come to my mind. 
I think um, in terms of what to see going forward with criticism, it's kind of like going back to the basics of like, so what is what is the purpose of it? Like, why do we even have it? And there is still that aspect that theater is, you know, fairly pricey. You know, like I, I have two small kids. If I'm going to go see a show, it's the ticket price and the babysitter and all that stuff. So I am going to look up a little bit something about a show before I go, because I'm only going to get to go to one show every like couple of months or so to in, pra in a practical way. So the the reviews help in that sense. They let you figure out what do I want to go see. But a lot, and so a lot of it, I think, comes down to audience as well. Like, what are you valuing? Um, whose word are you taking um because i know like at least in new york the new york times is just like the iron fist of what survives and what doesn't uh here in new york and so do and the reason why it is that way is because of the value we as as readers and audience members basically put on their say and it's a cyclical system because they're strong because we read it but we read it because they're the the main one and so it has to break somewhere and so I think what would be nice going forward is seeing more and this is maybe more of a utopian idea but that that uh, the people out there reading it and and consuming crit critiques are going to pick and choose which ones they actually value not based on the size of the institution maybe I feel like I'm always cheating on this question because my thesis is exactly about what is possible, what are possibility models. And so for me, I'm always like, I have four solutions that are proposed. <laughs> um, but even if I ingest and walking through them, I think a lot of them are the, the notes of what we've talked about here for today, especially when we're considering what is the most inclusive and what is the most sustainable for, our, for the future of criticism in general. And so we did touch upon what is mentorship and expansion the form actually look like, talking a little bit about digital reviews, being in conversation. What we're hearing now, again, is a kind of cohort model of what does it mean to be writing in community across disciplines, across institutions. Um, we've also touched on that culturally competent approach. What does it mean to actually acknowledge that we have our own gaps in the ways that we um, are writing about things that are different from us? And then I think what's most crucial, and I spend the most time writing about is having a reflexive practice, which is putting reflection in practice. It's a little Englishly there, but that means that we're taking our own reviews and we're critiquing ourselves as fiercely as we're critiquing other artists. What does it mean to have a reflexive practice about the work that I'm producing that mm -hmm. happens to be writing? And so those four things are the main things that I'm always preaching about when I get on topics like this, because we have all of the tools, we've seen these models, it's about putting them into practice and then figuring out what to do about the labor compensation um, difficulty around resources in a sense. And so I think that can even be addressed again in that abundance mindset and figuring out where the money is um, and reallocating it to these four possibility models for criticism. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think, I mean, also having four possibility models feels to me like, yes, okay, I have a number, I, we, can, we can go and do this. Um, <laughs> But I love that. And I love that the, there have been different models put forth here, Yasmin, in your list, but also in what it looks like in the classroom and what these different, um, I guess that there are so many possibilities. Um, yeah, I've been really struck by, earlier we talked today about um, research came up as a word in a bunch of different answers. Um, and I know that in dramaturgy, of course, that there's research, but I'm just, I'm really thinking about how like writing as a cohort and sharing research that you have with someone else who's seeing a show, like that feels to me as like a great scholar artist connection um, in academia that has really sought to be so gilded and working separately um, and breaking those really purposeful silos to see what that possibility looks like. So that's, I think, what's sticking with me the most right now. And I'm really excited about, and also about the community engagement that we talked about earlier and how that can lead to different ways that community conversations happen and how that leads to um, a great critical conversation. Yes. I, I think too, we're, I we're, wanted, oh, um, something I really loved, uh, actually, uh, uh, Yasmin, that you said earlier too, I think near the very beginning, questioning this idea of the separation of the artist and the critic. Um, and I think that honestly would be a very big 
thing as well because if you are experiencing art of a different culture and there are things you're not really getting um why not reach out with one or two questions to the writer or the director or one of the actors and and as the critic you can make of it as you will but you know there shouldn't be a problem with asking the person who created it well, what was the point of this or what were you trying to say and then writing a critique of that as well but yeah i think set create eliminating that separation is also probably really helpful yeah thank you all so much for that like this is just such a conversation that i think we can keep going at it for many many hours and I guess this is why this is turning into a series of conversations about theocriticism. So thank you. Um, I see that we've got one question from our audience here, and we've got about five minutes left of our session. So Amira, I'm going to turn it over to you to a question. Thank you all. This has been an amazing conversation. Hi, Marina. Um, one of the things that I've observed in my work as a cultural consultant is that uh, the audiences are predominantly non-SWANA in a lot of the theater that I've worked on. So I feel like to be realistic, I think the critics are speaking to the theater audiences rather than the people who wrote the work. And that is uh, an issue that I feel is really prevalent that if we want more works uh, representing our part of the world, then our community needs to come out and support it. They need to come and see the shows. And, and I think that I'm seeing a trend that a lot of the stories that keep getting published over and over sort of supports a white narrative. Um, and, and it's, uh, written it from the lens of the West. Um, and that is no coincidence either because that resonates with the theater going audiences. So that's an observation. But um, I personally feel, and I don't know how you all um, experienced this, that, uh, that mm, relying on my community, which that and community for criticism, um, or, or seeing their criticism as beneficial to theater hasn't really been that effective, partially because a lot of us bring our own like political experiences and likes and dislikes of this regime and that um, ethnic group and such. So a lot of what makes good theater gets diluted in these agenda-driven conversations. Um, and I was just curious, like from other countries and other parts of the world, if you've seen that, of course, um, if they're theater makers, it's, it's a different issue because they are actually understanding storytelling and theater making. But if it's the audience engaging with a critic, um, it's not always the most beneficial or effective way of receiving critique. Yes. So I guess the question is, do, have you all experienced that as well? Yeah, so, so Hermione, I'm just going to jump in here real quick. That is definitely a very huge thing. It's something that we've all seen. I've personally been at a performance that was, it was a useful again to play. It was incredible. And then the talk back that, that like didn't include, you know, Yusuf was not there, just went in a completely different direction. Because again, responding to that issue that you were speaking about of having that predominantly white uh, like audience in the space and just seeing how it was completely skewed. Um, we are unfortunately at time. So maybe because we need to wrap up um, here. So maybe if we just want to have one of you give a final uh, statement in response to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it's a matter of um in, include if the artist can't be there including what their ideas behind it and their intention is 
Um, again, going to that idea of separating the wall between the artist and the critique so that when the critique comes out, it includes something from the artist about the work itself. So at least that maybe can become part of the conversation within a room, uh, like an entirely white room, at least the artist's voice is there somewhere in the room to be to be touched on. So that could be one way to combat that maybe. And one thing I know we're at time, but the willingness of a critic to act actually um, engage in the dramaturgy materials that are a part of the production. Um, yeah. Because I, there have been situations where you have a gorgeous play right now, mm -hmm. and it seems like a critic has not even read it. Um, and that can be a choice, or that can be holding on for spoilers, but there's a lot of context that our artists already do about telling you who they are, putting their bodies in their work, and even around the theater company. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to know, the, the information is usually in front of you in some mm -hmm. regards, and it's just about a willingness. <laughs> to engage with materials that are also beyond the stage. Yeah, people have no problem reading Tom Stoppard's little novella before every work that he does. I don't see why they don't read our drum churching materials. <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, to all, yes and to everything. Um, more cultural competence is needed among our theater critics, among our audience members, among our dramaturgs. Uh, and we, we need more people uh, to be engaging with that. And, uh, and to really realize how that is, how a playwright is being honored in the process, how the artists are being honored and how our Swana communities are also uh, feeling welcome in these spaces. Uh, Myra, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank all of you for coming to this uh, wonderful session. Um, we have unfortunately come to the end of our conversation. Many thanks to our speakers, so Tarek and, and Aishan and Yasmin, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of you joining us live at the moment and those of you who will be watching uh, later on. Thank you to those at the uh, at Atha, the Atha conference as well. Uh, I'd like to remind you to check the rest of the Middle Eastern Theatre Focus Group panels at the Atha conference. We still have a few more days over here, so please come check them out. Um, and I'd also like to thank HowlRound for, for being the hosting, for hosting this program. Uh, as a reminder, all of the No Summary episodes live on Golden Thread's website and on HowlRound's as well. I also want to give a special thank you to Wendy Rice uh, for our a light live stream technician and to the rest of Golden Thread's incredible team, uh, Sahar, Michelle, Shayla, Linda, Sulana, and Heather. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for working behind the scenes. And a big thank you to our audiences. Coming up next at Golden Thread, we have the New Threads reading series with two plays in commission at the company, one by Adam Ashraf Asayek, uh, inspired by the story of the high profile political prisoner, Ala Ab uh, Abdel Fattah, and one by uh, our own Tarek here, Tarek Hamimi, inspired by the experience of the Black Panthers in Algiers. Algiers. And the Reorient Festival of Short Plays is happening in the fall, so stay tuned for that. For more info, you can visit the website goldenthread.org, uh, and there are some links in the chat for you as well. You can also join the email list to stay on top of programs and event events. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for your work today. Um, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.